Well, good morning. Oh, what in the world was that? Good morning. morning. Much better, much better. Had to wake you up after the joke. Good to see you guys today. Glad to have you here. You know, there is a healthy and an unhealthy fear. Um, The touching stove fear is a healthy fear. How many of you remember that time you touched the hot stove? Anybody remember that? I remember that, and I must have been little because I had to reach up, which isn't, uh, I'm noticing a whole lot shorter than I am now, but enough that I had to reach up for the stove. I still remember that. You know, this week was a little bit crazy, lots going on. Um, I was glad to be able to get back to uh, um, one of the uh, uh, hospices and be able to go in and visit uh, with one of the folks who is related to one of the members of our church and get to pray with them, and that was so great, and then had a funeral this week for a very young man, 52 years old, passed away this week. One of our church members who was helping that family uh, uh, was stabbed this week uh, uh, by a homeless man. Uh, a very interesting week, to say the least. So um, with all the stuff, so Thursday, Kristen and I decided uh, for a couple hours we would sneak over uh, to Universal Studios. Now, you need to know something about me. I used to ride roller coasters, and it wasn't a big deal, but anymore, I can't ride anything. Kristen got on the Hulk. Now, if you don't know how this works, they literally take everything away from you. You cannot have a pen, a phone, anything to get on this ride, which says to me, then you should not be on this ride. So she gives me all her stuff. She goes and rides the Hulk. She gets off the Hulk, says to me, Why weren't you where you said you would be? That's never happened to any husbands here. To which I responded, well, it was the second place I told you I would be that I was, which never goes well. So she comes off the Hulk, and I talk to her, and she says, that's not even a big deal to me anymore. Which is true, because I actually got back in time to watch her ride it in a row by herself like this the whole time, almost like she was bored on that ride. Now that is not normal. I just want to say that out loud because my wife's not watching. Although my mother is watching and it told me 12 times on my phone that she was watching. I'm not sure if she was sending that in. Fear is natural, but it's not always healthy. Now let me show you the first time that we, uh, in this series, that we talked about Moses, just to show you he was a normal person. Exodus 4, 2 and 3, this is our series verse. The Lord said to Moses, what's that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. And I love this. Moses did what God said. So Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. That is healthy fear. You don't identify the snake first and then run, regardless of what Don tells you there who loves snakes. You run, and then you identify the snake. And for some people in our church, I know that they think the only kind of snake is a dead snake. Right, I've heard that before. And, uh, but, you know, we have extremes when it comes to fear and faith. And last week we talked about Moses where he totally blew it. He uh, grew up, you've got to realize, he grew up as an Egyptian leader. He was the head of the corporation. And most of us have worked for a boss that thought they knew everything. Did you know there's one thing worse than uh, having no confidence? You know what it is? It's overconfidence. And so, um, you know, you get a college student and they go to their first year of college and they come home and they tell their parents everything they did wrong, right? That first year, they get a little bit of knowledge and they know everything. And then hopefully, as they go to graduate, they develop a healthy uh, uh, self-esteem that doesn't make them know everything, but they understand they need to learn. Now, all of us have worked with someone who thought they knew everything that knew nothing. I believe that Moses, when he was 40 years old and killed the man, thought that he knew more than he knew and felt like he had a right to go in and intercede and actually kill somebody to protect someone else. And yet we know how that turned out last week and So now we find him today, 40 more years in the wilderness. He is now 80 years old. 
And, and what's happening to him at this time is he's now humbled. He's been guiding sheep around. And so today we're going to look at this story of Moses and talk about how fear affects him. And we're going to look at a little bit of what we talked about last week and then move forward from there. Now, here's what I want to tell you about fear. If you're not careful, the wrong kind of fear can keep you from accomplishing what God has for you. It can keep you from loving people. It can keep you from living in the present because you're fearful of the future. And it can keep you from making a difference. You can trust God and deal with fear and still make a difference. So let's talk today about answering fear with faith. Number one, our first kind of fear that Moses deals with here is fear of the future. These are the what if questions. What if questions. These are questions when you have a doctor's report. And the doctor said, I saw a little something unusual on your scan. And that's all they tell you. And they said, we're going to do some more tests. And they send you home. So you go home and you Google it. You get on Cancerpedia. Right? Because as soon as you Google whatever symptom you have, you have cancer. So you say, well, what if? And you say, you know, dark spot on my left ear. Wikipedia, you're going to die, right? So you're like, what if? And so you start walking in this fear cycle if you're not careful. Listen to what Moses says. So we're going to pick up in verse 1, and then part of the story we're going to skip that we told last week, and then we'll move on. Moses answered, what if? So God says, Moses, I want you to do this. And Moses says, well, what if? What if they don't believe me or listen to me, and they say the Lord did not appear to you? And then we have the snake story we talked about last week with the staff. And then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. Now, this would have been great if I could have gotten a glove that I could just put, but I'm, I'm not even that smooth. I could never be a magician. But anyway, so Moses puts his hand inside his cloak, and then what happens? Moses put his hand in. When he took it out, the skin was leprous. Now, you've got to realize, we just read this like it's no big deal. You've read this story and heard this story. You're like, yeah, yeah, you got some leprosy. No, no, you've got to realize, when you pull your hand out with leprosy, your first thought has to be, um, is this permanent? I mean, Moses doesn't know he's about to undo it. If you woke up in the morning and your tongue was purple, and God said, I've decided to make your tongue purple, I mean, that would be bad. But leprosy was a life sentence back there and a horrible death. And so Moses put his hand and, and it becomes as white as snow. And then he says, now put it back into your cloak. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak. And when he took it out, it was restored. Here, we'll just, we'll just talk. It was restored like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, if they don't believe you or pay attention to the first sign, they might believe the second. I love that. God's like, well, they might believe. If they don't believe the snake, the, the staff becoming a snake, and then it becomes a staff again, maybe they'll believe the leprous hand. Right? By the way, the, the magicians that Pharaoh had could do tricks. They, they were tricksters. I mean, they would stand out front. Right? They did all that. I used to do that for my class. They thought it was the dumbest thing they'd ever seen, but they were just glad to not have to take notes. And then it says, if they don't believe the two signs, take some water from the Nile and pour it on dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. And we know later in the plagues this happens. And so God's given him three things, and Moses is still saying what if, and we're going to discover that in a minute. You ever say what if? You ever play the what if game? What if our government? By the way, the news, the job of the news, whatever news you're watching is giving you a what if question. Did you know that today? If you watch the news all week and you, you think it's great to have the news on 24-7 at your house, can I just tell you a secret? Turn it off. Just put on HGTV instead, and then you'll want to fix your house. I don't know. What do you, right? Right? So, so you watch the news, and what are they trying to do? They're trying to give you the what-if questions. One of my friends is a producer for the CBS Morning News, and I put that on Facebook one time, and she said, yeah. Yeah. Anger, fear, what if? What if the government does this? What if this group of people do that? What if this happens? What if that? Let me get you all worked up and freaked out. You know what happens when you do that? 
You don't pay attention to anybody near you. You lose God's direction for your life. And the enemy is using the very thing that you're looking at to fill your life, to fill your life. And no longer are you thinking about your neighbor and how to bless them or your spouse and how to encourage them. You're thinking, oh no, what if this happens? What if they do this? What if they take away my... Yeah? What if it is cancer? What if this does happen? Well, I'm going to give you a verse to tell you what if. God did not give us a spirit... That makes us afraid. This word afraid means dread. You ever dread anything? To the point that you're driving somewhere and it pops up in the back of your mind. What if my kid doesn't straighten up? What if that family member does this? What if? God did not give us a spirit that makes us afraid. But a spirit, I love this, of power and love and self-control. So there's three things that God does when we start saying, what if, but what if, but what if? Number one, he gives you power through the Holy Spirit. So whatever you're going to face, let's say that whatever the news told you is going to happen, happens. You've lost all your money because somebody taxed you to death. You lost all your freedom because somebody took it away. You You know, whatever your blank is, you fill it in. Guess what God will give you? Power to overcome. You're going to be okay. Could you just say that out loud? I'm going to be okay. Ready? One, two, three. Because here's the deal if you're a Christian. Let's say somebody kills you. You're okay. What? Eric, you're so weird. You're correct. I go and visit people that have new babies. And I visit people who are dying. And I visit people who just lost loved ones. And guess what I've figured out? When you have a love and trust relationship with Jesus, it doesn't matter how long your life is. Your days can be filled with his power instead of fear and too many people are wasting day after day walking in fear instead of his power and then it says you're filled with love what does that mean it means that when you're not walking in fear when you have his power even on your worst day god fills you with his love not just for you to hang on to but for you to be a blessing to somebody else So that no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what you're dealing with right now, God can use you to love someone else. I visited dying people, people with horrible brain cancer that looked at me and said, Pastor, can I pray for you? That's how good God's love is. That no matter what's happening in your life, he fills you with his love. Why? Because we want to do what if, what if, what if, what if. And God says, no, no, I've given you power. I've given you love. And then finally, self-control. What does self-control mean? That you can quit accepting every thought that comes in your mind is true. Did you know that every thought that comes in your mind is not true? You've believed some lies this week. You played the what if game. You freaked out about something that wasn't a big deal. I've never freaked out about something that's not a big deal, right? Have you driven with me? Right? We've all done that, and we all do it. If you are going through a hard time, realize, I don't have to focus on my trials. I can focus on Christ. Why? He's given me his power. So here's your first challenge, and you can say this to yourself. I believe the word of God. I have power. See, if you believe the word of God, no matter what happens in your life, you know what the end is? Eternity with him. So even the worst result on earth is the best result in eternity. So hang on to it. God, I'm going to walk in your power no matter what the doctor tells me. God, I'm going to walk in your power no matter what happens with my children, which sometimes I want to, you know, straighten them out. You ever say straighten them out? That's a very southern thing to say, by the way. Whatever that situation is at work, God, you've given me power to overcome it. Number two. Fear of failure. The fear that you're not qualified. Teenagers go back and forth between this and feeling like they know everything, right? Fear of failure. Kristen loves to read books in the car. I wish I could do that. I can't. So I drive and she reads. And she'll say, hey, listen to what this says. And yesterday she was reading a book and she said to me, she said, you know, we always thought lack of confidence was the worst thing. 
but they've discovered more and more that overconfidence actually makes worse performers and worse team players than people who are underconfident. And we've raised a generation of people that were so worried about their self-esteem that we've created kids who know nothing but think they know everything. You met those people? You hired those people at work by accident? You know, they seem so confident. Why? You ever met somebody who was confident in their abilities that had no idea what they were doing? Just watch American Idol. There are always people on there that think they can sing. And you're like, who told you you could sing? Overconfidence. I'm always, away of, uh, I'm always nervous about somebody who comes to me and says, Pastor, if you're ever out one week, I can preach for you. And I go, where would you used to preach? Oh, I never have preached before, but I just know I could. Well, do you lead a small group? No, I've never led a small group. You ever helped at a church? No. You ever been a part of that? No. But I could do it. <sighs> Moses said to the Lord, I love this, he interrupts God. Never interrupt God. I love this. Pardon me. I feel like Grey Poupon commercial. Pardon me. Pardon your servant, Lord. And then he says, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you've spoken to your servant. By the way, time out. That's a lie because in Acts it told us that Moses was a powerful speaker. And here's the thing. A lot of people think that Moses, some theologians think that Moses might have developed a stutter after his traumatic events of murdering somebody and having the guy he called grandpa want to kill him and chasing him out of Egypt as far as he could get away. So Moses says, I'm slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, I love this, uh, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Time out. God never asks a question he doesn't know the answer to. Early on in Genesis, when God says, where are you to Adam and Eve? Can I tell you a secret? He didn't lose them. He didn't create the entire universe and then be like, I can't see through some bushes. Okay? Where are you? What was he trying to tell them? Hey, where are you? Do you know where you are? So when God says this to Moses, God knows the answer, and he, know Mo he knows Moses knows the answer, and he's saying to God, I just turned your hand white. I just turned the stick into a snake. In the future, you might have the Nile to blood uh, uh, thing come up. And you think I can't help you talk? Now go. I will help you to speak and teach you what to say. See, we're very hard on ourselves sometimes, even when it's unrealistic. I've been 10 foot up on a ladder with a little bitty screw in my hand and my drill and gone to do the screw and dropped the screw and said to myself, doofus. I was in the kitchen yesterday. I reached over. I hit a glass. It went into the sink. It broke another glass and broke that glass. And I said to myself, doofus. How many of you have ever broken a dish or a glass? Can we just see that show of hands? All right. Anybody who didn't raise their hand is now a liar or asleep. One of the two. I'm not sure which. So here's the deal. We've all done it. So why are we so hard on ourselves about every little mistake, every little thing? Listen, be realistic. Understand that God has made you and he can use you even though it's you. Now, don't be overconfident like Moses was in the beginning and think, well, God needs me. <laughs> I can't wait till God uses me. You know, if God could only hear me speak. <laughs> uh, right? Hebrews 3 talks about it this way. I love this because it mentions Moses. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling. Did you realize you share in a heavenly calling? It means God says to you, I got work for you to do. Fix your thoughts on your failures. No. Fix your thoughts on your weaknesses. Nay, nay. Fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him. And I love this. Just as Moses was faithful in all of God's house. Moses broken, messed up, and yet God used him. Guess what? You're broken, you're messed up. Hey, hey, you know that problem you struggle with? You may never get that together. But his grace is sufficient for you. That even in your weakness, he can make you strong. You may never overcome that, but God can. 
Don't give up. Don't settle. Don't say this is just the way I am. I've always been this kind of person. Don't be Popeye. I am what I am, right? I said that more like a pirate. I'm not sure what that was about. You are not qualified. Just so you know, just get over that. You're not qualified, but he is. So hang on to him. He's the one who advocates for you. When you go before God, you don't go before God because you have your act together. You go before God because Jesus has his, his act together. Second challenge is this. I focused on his strength, not my weakness. So fear of the future, fear of failure. Finally, fear of frustration. I don't want to. If you've had a teenager, you've seen this. They come in the house, they kick off their shoes, they kick off their socks, and they start to walk away from them. And you look at them and you say, hey, wait just a minute, mister. Pick up your shoes and socks. And what happens at this point is they begin to fight with you, which takes longer than picking up their shoes and their socks. Has anybody experienced this other than, I mean, not that my children, because my children go, yes, father, we will clean the house. By the way, when my children do that, this is what I say what do you want? How much do you need? Right? Because it's normal to rebel. Listen to Moses, 80 years old. I think he was ready to be done. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. And he doesn't even mince words. Send somebody else. I don't want to. By the way, you realize how few people serve other people and yet think they're good Christians? Moses thought he had his act together, and when God asked him to do something, he's like, nope, don't want to. And we don't want to all the time. We have every excuse in the book. I don't want to because I did before. I don't want to because my kids are grown. I don't want to because my kids are young. I don't want to because I'm retired. I don't want to because, what's your excuse? God's not listening to him. Listen. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. In some translations, it says, even though the Lord's anger burned against Moses, he said, what about your brother, Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He's on his way to meet you, and he'll be glad to see you. You'll speak to him, put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it'll be as if I were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But Take this staff in your hand so you can go and perform the signs with it. God pretty much looked at him and he said, I don't want to. And God's like, okay, you're doing it anyway. I mean, I'll send somebody to help you. By the way, you never see Aaron speaking for Moses. Just a little, little side note. Galatians 6, 9 through 10. You think you're the only one that gets tired? First century church. Let us not become weary in doing good. Why? Because when you help people, it's painful. I can't tell you how many times over the years I thought, no good deed goes unpunished. You go out of your way to help somebody, they send the thing to you late, they make your life miserable, they yell at you about something you did to help them. You ever had that one happen? That's fun. But what do you say? Don't become weary and do good. Why? For at the proper time, we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up. So that means even during the winter, you sow seeds. Even in the hardest times of your life, you do what's right. Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let's do good to all people especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Last but not least, listen, I plant seeds of obedience and blessing no matter what the season. Now, I want to read you what's happened the last two days. One of my friends who's never asked for anything post, posted this. I have a single mom friend in Texas who desperately needs tangible support going through this with her two small children. If you don't know what's going on in Texas, you really haven't watched the news. It, they're freezing to death out there. No power, no water. Big problem, especially for people who have very little means. She has no heat, no power, no water, and this has been the hardest time of her life. And then she went on to say, and her church has not helped her at all. Now, I don't know if that meant her church wasn't able to or didn't want to. And then she says, if you would be willing, I would love to send you details on how you can help. Here's what she posted yesterday. I want to take a minute and say a huge thank you to those of you that gave to my single mama friend severely affected by the storm in Austin. I can't stop crying. I'm blown away by your generosity. You have given me faith in humanity and shown me that we can just take what we have and God can bless it and break it to literally 5,000 different ways to bless people 
like he did with the loaves and fishes in Matthew in the Bible. In less than 24 hours, listen to this, $5,000 was given. 5,000 multiple exclamation points. Unbelievable. My friend has enough to pay her renter's insurance, deductible, and she has forwarded on your money to help other single moms in need in her community. Some of them work hourly and missed hours of work because of the storms, and she was able to give them money to pay for groceries for their kids and to help pay their rent. That also shows my friend's giant heart to give beyond what she was given and to think of all the others around her that needed it. Thank you for God showing us that we are not alone. Thank you to each one of you for being kind to a stranger you knew nothing about and gave without any pretense. We need each other. And then she ends her letter by saying this, I'm blown away. I will never get over this. You never know. The blessing that you give, even in the middle of your hardest day, during a season of winter for you, during a season of difficulty for you, keep planting seeds. Seeds of blessing, seeds of encouragement, seeds of love. Get your eyes off of you and your wants and your needs and your fears and say, God, just use me today regardless of what's happening. And he will use you to impact the lives of other people. That's the difference God can make for you as a Christian. If you're here today or you're watching online and you've never given your life to Christ, you can do that today. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if you're here today and you want to give your life to Christ, the Bible says that God sent his only son into the world. Not condemn the world, but so that the world might be forgiven through him. So if you're here today and you want to be forgiven, you want to receive his grace I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to surrender your life to him. Maybe you're watching online. You can send me a note, direct message, whatever you like, and I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. I had a man come up to me yesterday and say, I was baptized as a child, but I want to know that I'm a Christian. Maybe that's you today. If that's you, I'd be glad to talk to you after the service. And if you're here as a Christian and the truth is you've been playing the fear game, hey, live in his spirit and his power instead. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for these moments. I thank you for each one who's watching online, each one that will watch later in the week, those who are here today. Father, I pray that you would continue to bless your word as it goes forward. Lord, I thank you that we can look at a story from 4,000 years ago and realize we have not changed a bit. We all need your power. We need your love. And we're thankful for your grace in the middle of all the challenges of life. Father, I pray that we would be strong in you strong in your love. Help us to be those who spread seed everywhere we go, that we do what you've called us to do in blessing others. In Jesus' name, amen.